The March of Remembrance and Hope is a program that was founded about 20 years ago for the purpose of teaching young people the lessons of the Holocaust to build a better world for all humanity. For the last 20 or so years, we've been taking many, many university students from across Canada to Germany and Poland to go to the most difficult parts of human history, but for one purpose, and that purpose is to create a better world for all members of the human family. Students go to these places with Holocaust survivors who transmit their most difficult memories to these students, but these students become the bearers of their memories and pledge to create a world where nobody will have these kinds of memories ever again. And we've seen tremendous, tremendous results from the programs seen students come back to their communities and play very important roles in building up their communities in their churches and their mosques and their synagogues and through all sorts of positive social actions in their communities. So we're very grateful to be part of this program. This area had a uh, higher Jewish population, per percentage-wise, than the rest of Berlin. So we are entering the more or less a Jewish neighborhood. We have a marker here. This is a site where uh, a synagogue, which was built in 1909, uh, uh, stood. It was part of, a, of an apartment building, in integrated into uh, an apartment building here. It was destroyed in 1956. And that is the case with many buildings that survived the, the war, the damage, the destructions, and then the synagogues were not used anymore because they were not needed, because there were no Jews any longer uh, in Germany. You have that in a variety of places uh, throughout Germany. And then you, if you go through Germany, with the, the, mainly in the south of Germany, Bavaria, Franconia, where you had Jewish communities in the countryside, and then the old synagogues were used as warehouses, as barns, as sort of workshops for car repair companies, whatever, because there were no Jews who made any use of the synagogue. What was here, right at this place, and right where this, this um, statue here kind of marks the entrance of, was a Jewish old age home. The Nazis took it over and they used the old age home as a collection point where they would bring Jews together before they deported them. This collection of photos shows various stages of the transport of prisoners arriving to Birkenau. The selection would take the process at the end of this large platform. There would be one of the uh, German doctors who were working at the camp, and uh, he will be in charge of making a decision who is going to be sent to work or not. 
uh, the other group was selected to be sent uh, directly to gas chambers that were located in the back of the camp. More than 400,000 Hungarian Jews were deported here. I wanted to share a little bit of a story of one very young woman who was on that transport. Irene was a little 13-year-old girl among them. Irene spent about eight months here. They get off of the train and they go through a selection. And Irene and her two sisters are selected to work. And the rest of the family is sent to the gas chambers. In the 80s, maybe the early 90s, Irene's daughter came across a copy of the Auschwitz album, which is the publication by Yad Vashem of all of these photographs of the May 27th and 28th Hungarian transport. And inside, Irene found two photographs that were very, very important. One of them is a photograph of her mother and her two brothers waiting in the woods to be sent to the gas chambers. She didn't have any pictures of her mother and brothers and suddenly she has a picture of her family. She also found a picture of herself on the selection ramp. Everyone else is starting to move away and she's looking back. It seems to be a photograph of her watching her sister run to her mother. This is the block that my mother was and her sister were in. She had seven brothers and sisters, um, parents, grandparents, some of her siblings were married and had kids. They lived across the street from the synagogue. Um, her, they had a store there, they, all, they, they lived above the store, um, and they had a full life. They were, uh, there, were, there were about 15,000 people in her town and 5,000 Jews. And uh, the first week of the war in 1939, September, um, the Nazis came into her town and burned the synagogue down and destroyed the Jewish cemetery. They then took um, many of the men to the town square, where I've also been, and shot them. And so she was brought here and they were here from September 44 to December 44. There were so many times where she could have or should have died and she survived and I don't know how that happened. And now for the first time I know where because this was her block. So it's pretty like oh wow I don't have to imagine anymore now I know she was here. It's super meaningful for me to have you be here with me. <laughs> for me to be here the first time to know this is where she was. Are you still keep in touch with anybody? Oh, yes, very few. Very few are left now. Mm -hmm. In fact, uh, next year they are inviting us again to come. But they said, how many people are around for the liberated Dachau? <laughs> so I found only one. And I pulled him up. I said, are you coming to Dachau next week? He said, once to be in Dachau is enough. I'm not going the second time. <laughs> This is Nebel Ruven, my cousin, who died in Dachau, and my son is named after him. Here you see Kaunas, Lithuania, murdered in Dachau. L -K -N. 
Clover Elsa. This Elsa. is my grandmother. Huh. Yeah. Murdered in Mary Trostinets in Belarus. Murdered in Mary Trost in Belarus. Yeah. yeah. for Tosco Anoni. He was uh, an Italian um, soldier um, in Poland and he was able to rescue Clara Silberman um, and he brought her back on the train with him to Italy um, without anybody knowing and she stayed with his family for a number of years before she was able to travel to Israel. I'm walking for Alter W. I don't know his last name. Um, but he was a Holocaust survivor born in Poland and his earliest memories that he has of his life is his mother dying at age 30, um, finding his dad in an open grave after he had been shot. Um, after he went and he was in a concentration camp for 35 months and even though after he was liberated the Russian army actually encouraged him to go take revenge and to go kill Germans and rob. He always lived by his dad's motto which was to um, to judge people by their merits and not by their ethnicity and to hate hatred and to shun violence and um, I decided to walk for him because I think um, I was talking a little bit earlier like this place was built on because of hate like everything I'm surrounded by hate um, but he chose to see the positive of the situation and to keep his identity when everyone is, was encouraging him to lose it. So I'm walking for um, Fila Gibson. She was a Polish survivor of the Holocaust and she was liberated in um, Schautzlar camp in Czechoslovakia in 1945 and she was there for a number of years. Um, she was in like a women's concentration linen camp and she, um, I chose her because when she did her interview for the USC, she continually said that, you know, that she felt bad to do the interview because she didn't think she had it as bad as everybody else. I'm marching for someone named Rudolf Brazda, who was sent to a concentration camp in Buchenwald for his sexuality um, and survived. Um, and actually like had a little bit of a thing with a Nazi who was keeping him prisoner and that's how he survived. I'm marching for Elie Wiesel. Uh, he was a Nobel laureate and Holocaust survivor and the writer of my favorite book, Night. Um, and now being on this trip, I realized there are many Elies <laughs> in, the, in the Jewish uh, uh, culture. And uh, I guess I'm walking for all the Elies past, present and future. I'm marching for Vladek Spiegelman. Uh, he was a Polish citizen and Auschwitz survivor. Uh, and his son, Art Spiegelman, is a famous writer who created a graphic novel called Mouse based on his father's uh, life story uh, in Auschwitz. And I'm marching for him because even though he, he's been through all the horrors of, of the Auschwitz and the Holocaust, he always had hope, he always had resilience, and because of his resilience, he could save not only his life, but some other uh, members of his family. And I truly admire his courage and resilience, and this is why I'm marching for him. Uh, I'm marching for Philip Reitman. He was the first Holocaust survivor that I met, and his story really impacted me. Um, I decided to march for him because after all the terrible things that he went through, he still put such an emphasis on wanting to love instead of hate and it to me it would seem that it would be easy to hate people who could do such terrible things but he still chose to love rather than hate. Um, I chose to march for um, Margaret Meiser. I chose to march for her because of what she says about forgiveness making you a better person and her story connected to her mother. Um, so I chose to march for Irene Fogelweiss, who is the same Irene that we've been learning about on our walk today, which is kind of kismet. 
um, her story just just really struck me in terms of the resilience that she has. And then um, the the quote that stuck out for me was that desperate people will always look for some sign of hope. Um, and so I'm hoping through this trip that that we can be that sign of hope. I'm marching for my grandfather, Anthony Madge. He was a Polish Catholic sent um, by the Nazis to Germany for forced agricultural labor, where eventually um, he would escape when the German front line was collapsing and join with the um, U.S. Army and um, help liberate the country, as well as after the war, uh, guard um, SS officers for the Nuremberg trials. I'm working for Bratislav Bartoszewski. He was a Polish resistor, leader, educator, historian, and the reason why I'm walking for him is because he understood the power of ideas and he endured imprisonment, standing up for what he believed. And um, after the war, he became a, a diplomat for peace. And I think that's really important. I'm marching for Frida Adam, who was a Righteous Among the Nations from Berlin. She um, hid her friend Erna and Erna's brother for over two years during the war. Um, and in a quote from a, a newspaper article from 1994, um, Frida said, if a person does something, more is possible than one thinks. So well, so I just hope we'll keep moving. Of course, I'm here. This place was one of the training sites for uh, members of the secret services. What was being practiced here was torture. What was being practiced here were executions. My friend, this is one of the, for me, one of the worst places of Poland, of the Holocaust. This building, it tells us how the Holocaust was prepared with precision, with scientific theories, with professors coming to give lectures, with education on how to kill people. It is, in a way, a greater condemnation of the Nazi system than Auschwitz is, because Auschwitz was a result of this teaching. This is where the mass graves of uh, three mass executions. My grandmother lies in a mass grave in Belarus. It's in a place called Nelly Trotsinets. She's one of 10,000 Austrian Jews, almost 10,000 Austrian Jews who were murdered there. My child, Anne-Marie Klauber, Vienna, August 10th, 1942. My dearest Muki Lion, I have now lived here for four years, in the world. I know that I have been massively affected by being the child of someone who lost her world. I often say, as you'll hear other children of survivors say, that one of the most cataclysmic events of my life happened before I was born, and it was the Holocaust and then growing up in the shadow of the Holocaust and growing up with a gaping hole and not being able to identify it, just knowing that it was there and having a sense of wonder that for other people it wasn't there. So I know how deeply I was affected. And I know, I believe that my children were also, because how could they not be? And I wonder how will little Jacob be affected? And how many times will we keep telling the story, hoping to find, you know, the word that we all use about so many things these days, which is closure. I don't know how to find closure. I don't know how to find the answer to why because I actually can't even step back and say, how, how could this have happened? How? Some people write books, some people make films, dances. There are so many different ways of expressing a need to memorialize, to commemorate 
monuments and, and sculptures. And honestly, for me, when I was invited to start working on MRH more than 20 years ago, I thought, this is it for me. I don't want a statue, I'm not going to write a book, but being here with you, that after this 10 days, that you understand something about the Holocaust, about evil, and good, and hope, and despair, and what it means to be a community and to be kind to each other, and take that out into your lives in whatever way that you will always remember, you will always remember Ellie Gotts and you will remember Felice and Felice's mother and you'll remember that there was a woman who was a completely anonymous person, just a regular person trying to live her life whose name was Elsa Klauber. I want to tell you one quick story about one man, a Nazi, who actually indirectly asked me for forgiveness. And I learned a lot from him. I had a company in Toronto and we were buying hardware, certain metal parts from a company in Germany. So I went to deal with them. The vice president finance comes up to me, takes me aside, puts his arm around me, takes me sort of a little in a corner. He says, Mr. Gott, you were in Dachau? Yes. You are a Jew? Yes. Come, let's go and talk. I want to tell you something. We go to a coffee shop. As soon as we sit down, he says, I joined the Nazi party when I was 18. After a whole day doing business, I'm not going to argue with him about it. I said, I suppose you had to. I make it easy. No, he says, I didn't have to. I wanted to. Okay. He says, my father said to me one day, Lauf nicht mehr. don't run with these people, they are bad people. And I was furious with him. I walked away. Two weeks later, he said it again. Don't go with these Nazis, they are bad people. Father, I said to him, if you say it a third time, I'll go to the Gestapo. He was going to report his father. He says, I was ready to send my father to Dachau. Now I was shocked. You may disagree with your father politically, but you don't send him to a concentration camp to die. So I said, was he a bad father? He was a wonderful father, he says. That's so, what I want you to understand, he says. When I heard that man speak, who is that man? Hitler. When I heard that man speak, cold used to run down my spine. I was prepared to do anything for him. Word. So I asked him carefully, and did you do anything? And he understood immediately. He said, no, I was at Stalingrad. I nearly lost my leg. I was wounded just before they were surrounded. So I survived. I said, did you know what was done in your name? Yes, he says, I saw it. I saw in the Ukraine, they took a bunch of Ukrainian peasants stuck them into a wooden church, poured gasoline, and burned them all to death in their own church. So I said, tell me, why is it that Germans now say, we didn't know this was done in our name? He says, don't you understand? Because we are ashamed. We have committed a crime that will not be forgiven for a thousand years. And then he said something I want you all to hear. He said to me, I want you to understand one thing. I joined the Nazi party not because I wanted to be a murderer. I joined because I was an idealist. I was prepared to give my life for my country. Remember that. Remember those words. Young people can be led to hell singing. Young people like to be idealistic. Young people at 18 are willing to give themselves to something greater than themselves than just getting a job or doing something. We can be misled and we can go singing.
doing terrible things. So I teach students now, be careful whom you believe, be careful whom you follow. If you think that one politician suddenly has all the answers to all the questions in the world, be careful. Listen to someone else because you are being hypnotized. That's the message. Thank you. We are very, very fortunate to be among the few people on this planet who have the privilege of both meeting Holocaust survivors and righteous among the nations. The righteous didn't just save Jews during the Holocaust, they saved the very reputation of humanity because if there hadn't been any righteous, we should basically give up hope in humanity. So I personally want to thank this heroic, courageous woman for saving the reputation of humanity. historię młodej dziewczynki żydowskiej, Miry. Ona w moim domu rodzinnym znalazła ocalenie. W 1941 roku, w marcu, już było przygotowane w Krakowie getto i wszyscy mieszkający na terenie Krakowa Żydzi byli zmuszeni przenieść się do getta. Wszelkie próby ucieczki z getta karane były natychmiastową śmiercią a jakakolwiek, jakiekolwiek próby pomocy ze strony Polaków także były karane śmiercią. To był właśnie rok 1943, w którym spotkałyśmy się z Miri. Stało się to za przyczyną mojej cioci, która przyszła do nas i prosiła mamę moją o to, żeby w naszym domu mogła przez kilkanaście dni ukryć się trzynastoletnia dziewczynka Miri. Ciocia opowiedziała nam zresztą skąd inną, skomplikowaną bardzo sprawę Miri i jej próby ratowania się, a teraz mówiła o tym, że Miri udało się uciec z getta przed jego likwidacją, ale nie miała normalnego domu. I w naszym pokoju też mieliśmy problem, bo przecież do nas przychodziła nasza rodzina, nasi znajomi, bywały i osoby nieznajome i Nikt spośród nich nie mógł wiedzieć, że z nami w naszym pokoju przebywa Miri. Musieliśmy ukryć Miri i zrobiliśmy to przy pomocy y, przemeblowania mieszkania. W jednym kącie ustawiliśmy szafy w taki sposób, że tam się tworzyła kryjówka i Miri tam wchodziła w momencie, kiedy ktoś się u nas zjawił. Mama moja zwróciła się do jednego z naszych gości, księdza katolickiego, Poprosiła go, żeby postarał się dla Miri o świadectwo chrztu. Dokument, który miałby potwierdzać, że jest Polką, katoliczką. I księdzu udało się taki dokument zdobyć. Ten dokument pozwolił nam zameldować Miri w administracji naszej kamienicy, gdzie podaliśmy, że jest naszą kuzynką, która zawsze mieszkała we wschodniej części Polski, a kiedy tam rozgorzała wojna między Niemcami i ówczesnym Związkiem Radzieckim, ona utraciła swoich rodziców i przyszła do nas jako do rodziny. I teraz poprawiła się nasza sytuacja. Mogli zobaczyć, wszyscy już mogli zobaczyć mieli. Zarówno ci nasi sąsiedzi, z którymi myśmy zresztą nie utrzymywali żadnych kontaktów, osoby przychodzące do nas, jak i mogła wychodzić na ulicę. Jej wyjścia na ulicę były niebezpieczne, dlatego że ona się urodziła w Krakowie, mieszkała przed wojną tutaj i zaczęła chodzić nawet do szkoły. Ktoś mógł ją rozpoznać. W tym czasie sytuacja polityczna Niemców była dla nich bardzo już niekorzystna. Do Krakowa przybliżała się Czerwona Armia. Upłynęło zaledwie kilka tygodni i w Krakowie rozgorzały ostre, krótkie, ale ostre walki i Niemcy byli zmuszeni Kraków opuścić. Skończyła się okupacja. Byliśmy szczęśliwi. Nasze życie, życie Miry zostało uratowane. Ale Miri była smutna. Ona zdała sobie sprawę, że ona nie ma domu, nie ma rodziny. Ona nie wie, jaka będzie jej przyszłość. W maju 1945 roku z niemieckiej niewoli wrócił ojciec Miri. Bardzo niedługi czas później wrócił brat Miri, Aleksander. Był starszy od Miri a miał bardzo dramatyczne przeżycie. 
On w 1943 roku, w momencie likwidacji krakowskiego getta, razem z matką był zmuszony wsiąść do wagonu bydlęcego. Było wiadomo, że to jest już kres, że to jest obóz śmierci na, na końcu tego transportu. On wyskoczył w nocy spędzącego pociągu. Niestety matka tym transportem została przewieziona do Bełżca i ona tam poniosła śmierć. Ale uratowała się jeszcze siostra Miri i Aleksandra, bliźniaczka. bliźniaczka. Ona ją, ją uratowała rodzina rolników spod Krakowa. Rodzinie Miri było bardzo trudno tutaj w Krakowie, w ich rodzinnym mieście wrócić do jakiegoś normalnego życia. Ale w Krakowie działała organizacja żydowska, która pomagała Żydom ocalałym z Holokaustu wrócić do właśnie normalnego życia. Ta organizacja ogłosiła możliwość wyjazdu do Izraela i obie dziewczynki, Miri i Szoszana, zdecydowały się wyjechać, opuścić Polskę. Jeszcze przez okres dwóch lat przebywały we Włoszech. Tam był przygotowany specjalny obóz dla młodzieży i one tam uczyły się głównie języka hebrajskiego. W Izraelu znalazły się po roku 1900, znaczy w roku 1948, kiedy już oficjalnie powstało państwo Izrael. Wszystko się zmieniło i w tym samym roku Miri z rodziną przyjechała odwiedzić Kraków. I już w następnym roku, 1990, w maju, przez trzy tygodnie byliśmy naprawdę niezwykle serdecznie goszczeni przez całą rodzinę Miri. Umożliwili nam zwiedzenie całego kraju. W jednym z ostatnich dni pobytu zostałam poproszona do Instytutu Yad Vashem w Jerozolimie i tam na bardzo przejmującej uroczystości został mi wręczony dyplom, medal, który odebrałam w imieniu mojej już nieżyjącej matki i także nieżyjącej siostry i swoim własnym. Cieszę się, że w moim życiu tego rodzaju zdarzenie miało miejsce. Cieszę się tym bardziej, że Miri, o której tu opowiadaliśmy, żyje. Ona, to jest zdjęcie z roku 2016. Bardzo dziękuję za wysłuchanie mojego opowiadania. I chciałabym Wam wszystkim, drodzy Państwo, przekazać jak najserdeczniejsze moje życzenia, żeby Wasze życie było szczęśliwe, żeby było pozbawione tych wszystkich cierpień, jakie były udziałem poprzedniego pokolenia i żebyście osiągnęli wszystko, do czego dążycie, żyli w kraju rozwijającym się, w kraju, w którym panuje prawdziwy pokój. protect you and yeah it's a medicine that we use every day I think I speak for everyone here and saying your story is a huge inspiration of bravery and compassion in trying times <laughs> together uh, over 400,000 pairs of shoes. There will be a little bit of straw on each level of the of the bed. You would get very little food. This is the crematorium. Bodies would be put on these metal shelves and would be pushed into the the ovens. Really important and 
um, I think what would break my heart the most is if this entire room feels hopeless tomorrow. Uh, or, I mean, after the experience. Um, so, I think something really important for me and uh, that I would like to encourage everyone is that we keep pushing at the core because this really moves the core of our being. And we try to find that hope in whatever we feel that that hope is and probably that won't come tomorrow um, but it, it will come at some point and, and we need to we need to find that I think I forgot who said it the other day but someone said the Holocaust wasn't six million plus victims it was one plus one plus one. yeah and that really stuck with me because it, you know the Holocaust isn't just numbers it was a human experience and we're all human first and then label second, I guess is a good message that's come from here. And just like they had human experiences, I think it's gonna be a very real human experience for us tomorrow too. So I encourage people to, to, to feel that. And I mean, especially things like, uh, most of us haven't been to a gas chamber yet because uh, it wasn't open in my Danic, right? I mean, that's the core um, human experience, especially with something as heavy as this. Um, it, it's hard to hide that because it's so impactful. So really just as we've been progressing towards this moment tomorrow, it seems, is, is to remember the human aspect of, of what we're doing as well. And think of the people who lived it, but also think of yourself walking through there tomorrow. And, um, you know, think of your own compassion and emotion and feelings and all the rest of it. And I think that's going to be really important and that's going to be very emotional and very impactful. So I'm, I'm originally from Saskatchewan here. Now, I've not, I haven't seen any of this part of Canada because it's too far away. Also in Canada, there's about 500 different indigenous nations. The, I think the most traditional is uh, called Pierogi. <laughs> Dziękuję moim uczniom, że tak wspaniale się integrowali, że, że stanęli na wysokości zadania. Dziękuję też gościom, że też z moimi uczniami tak wspaniale tutaj no, się bawili, bo widziałem to przed chwileczką. No i cóż, życzę, żeby ten pobyt w Polsce i w Makowie, jak wrócicie do Warszawy, był dla Was jak najbardziej udany. Dziękuję serdecznie za uwagę. Każde z tych spotkań jest inne, jest bardzo interesujące, ale istotne jest to, że dzięki tym spotkaniom nawiązuje się taka więź między Polakami a Kanadyjczykami czy Izraelczykami. Ja mam nadzieję, że nie tylko w ramach takiego projektu, który tutaj co roku robi Eli, będziecie przybywali do Polski, do Makowa, tylko już właśnie na bazie tych dzisiejszych no, kontaktów e, będziecie się kontaktowali, przyjeżdżali do siebie. Przynajmniej jeżeli byłyby dwie takie pary, to będę bardzo szczęśliwy. I want to share with you one story before we conclude with some singing together. And it connects to Mako. Um, in all, all the years of research on the Holocaust, I came up, across a person by the name of Leib Langfuss. Leib Langfuss was a rabbi from Makov Mazieski. He was deported to Auschwitz-Birkenau. And in Auschwitz-Birkenau, his entire family was murdered immediately. Leib Langfuss ended, working up, ended up working in the Sonderkommando. In other words, he was working in the actual gas chambers. And he was part of a group of Jewish people that took part in a revolt in 1944, at the end of 1944. They blew up one of the crematoria and they were executed by the Nazis. Remarkably, a number of years later, digging in the rubble of Auschwitz-Birkenau, they found his diary. So Leib Lundfuss was writing 
stories about what he experienced, and each story is more heartbreaking than the rest. In this story, Le Blanca sees a group of Jewish prisoners and Polish prisoners being pushed into the gas chambers. And the last thing he hears them doing is the Polish girls were singing the Polish national anthem, Poland is not yet lost, and the Jewish girls were singing what would become the Israel's national anthem, the Hope or Hatikva. And in his diary, he writes, in this cursed place, their anthems mingled and went up to the very heavens. That story took place some 75 years ago in a country that was brutally oppressed by Nazi Germany, where people in their last breaths before they were murdered were singing their national anthems. We are now visiting Poland, free and democratic Poland, in a country which has embraced democracy. And it's important for us not to take for granted the remarkable progress that has taken place in this country since Nazi Germany's fall and since the end of communism in Poland.
Uh, there are stones of various sizes. There are large stones with names of towns. And they are towns from which transports would arrive here. There are also a few stones here on the side leading up to the main area of the monument. Uh, names on these stones uh, are the names of countries from which citizens would be murdered. One of the ways we get, we resist against the evil of Hitler's Nazi Germany is by practicing the exact opposite of what he wanted us to practice. This is a world of endless cruelty and brutality. There's a quote which I think about often when I'm here, and that quote goes like this. Six million Jews were not murdered in the Holocaust. Six million were not murdered. It was one plus one plus one. And in the large scale of numbers, we often forget the individuality, the hopes and the dreams of those individuals who were murdered in the Holocaust. And what, what would they have wanted most from us? To build a world of kindness, love, peace, justice, and equality. And so thank you for making sure that the world never forgets. probably not going to hit us for a while. It was so powerful. It has inspired me. Concentration camps were this effort of stripping people from their humanity, and that was not the case. People couldn't be stopped from loving each other. People couldn't be stopped from having hope. At Treblinka, I think one of the most striking things for me was, was the trees that were going around. and. At the Umschlag plots, I don't know if anyone noticed, but behind the memorial there's this gorgeous tree that grows up through the back of the memorial. And I was walking out of Treblinka and I just thought, you know, we're, we're leaving this place of horrible sadness and pain and then we're forced to walk through those trees. 
And to me, those trees were, as we leave these places of darkness, that there's beauty all around. And so we can still remember what happened and we can take those things with us, but we have to go out into the beauty of the world and, and we take those things with us, but that we're surrounded by those trees. And, you know, I see the two of you and, and the testimonies that you shared with us and, and that you are these living, breathing memories of the Holocaust, but you're not showing us pain and suffering. You're, you're showing us hope and gratitude and generosity and kindness and, and all the things that we hope to take with us. And so you guys are those trees and, and I hope that all of us can kind of be those living, breathing, beautiful things that, that surround the memory of the Holocaust. March of Remembrance and Hope. March. Left, right, left. Left, right, left. We march for those who are left. Left behind, left with complete loneliness, left to rebuild their lives. Remembrance. We remember the actions of intolerance. We remember the selfless actions of the righteous among nations. We remember the acts of resistance, both physical and spiritual. We remember the lives lost, too soon without good cause. We remember their names. We remember their hometowns. We remember their stories. We remember now and forever. Hope. We hope for open-mindedness and compassion in others. We hope for equality and inclusion across nations. We hope that Holocaust survivors recognize that their resilience, both then and now, is inspiring. We hope that our actions will speak louder than our words. March for those who are unable to. Understand the importance of remembrance. Have hope and take action to better our world. March of Remembrance and Hope.